so this is, as opposed to the two debates we just had about localized disease, uh, where really we're struggling with a disease that is not necessarily lethal, you, you serve a protect of all survival curves that are just flat. Here we're going to deal with a lethal uh, phenotype of a disease, so really serious stuff. Uh, we actually had a hard time, Bertrand and I, to decide uh, which one of us would do the pros and the against. Uh, I, I think we, we think quite the same, to be honest, so we almost randomized. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to do the, the pro, but, but really we, we could really have switched. So this is about mostly de novo metastatic disease. And uh, uh, many of us in the Western world believe that it was now a non-existing situation or a very rare situation. So let's look at the data regarding the incidence. Well, first of all, in the US it's true less than 5% with newly diagnosed prostate cancer do have established metastasis when they're diagnosed with their cancers. But actually, probably uh, this is increasing with less um, PSA screening. So it's rare, but it's rare. In Europe, depending on where you go, somewhere between 5 to 30% of all uh, patients who are diagnosed with their prostate cancers. Now, having said that, if you go to countries such as India or uh, China, all my colleagues uh, are telling me that it's above 70 or 80% of patients who are diagnosed with prostate cancer. So it, it's huge. And uh, of course, you know that these are not really small countries. So worldwide, it's a big issue. Many men are suffering from the nervo metastatic prostate cancer. Okay, fine. Now, let's come back to the West. And let's look at who really dies from prostate cancer. And this is an exercise we, we've made at my center, just looking at patients who died from their disease and looking back to the charts, what was the original situation when they were diagnosed with their cancers. Actually, less than half of them had upfront localized disease and then they relapsed and eventually died from the disease, while the other big half was made by patients with de novo metastatic disease. So even in Western countries where these patients are rarer, of course, they're uh, over-expressed uh, when it comes to, to, to death. So it's tr a truly important situation. And unfortunately, we had only a few randomized phase 3 trials uh, focusing on uh, that situation until recently. So this is a typical example. This is Pierre. No past medical history besides hypertension cholesterol. Some uh, urinary symptoms. Clinically, it's a T3, glycine 7, PSA is 30. CT shows some lymph nodes. We don't necessarily care about that, but most importantly, the burn scan shows um, uh, bony dissemination. And uh, my question, I don't know if we have the time, we, we should make that uh, really brief, is how to best treat Pierre. So please vote uh, very rapidly. Who would give Pierre just ADT alone? Who would give him ADT plus chemo, ADT plus zoidinic acid, ADT plus abiratron or ANZA, or ADT plus a local treatment. Please vote. And you can just choose for one. Okay, quite split. So uh, local treatment, zolinic acid, I think we have good data not uh, for, for using zolinic acid. Again, we will come back to that. Uh, my slides, please. Thank you. So, what about the data? We have now three randomized phase three trial looking at the role of those tax cell chemotherapy being used upfront together with ADT. Straightforward comparison: one arm being ADT, the other one being ADT plus chemo, six to nine cycles. So, uh, one French trial, one U.S. trial, and then I will talk about the British trial. Most of these trials accrued their, speci their patients in the last 2000 with minor uh, variations. The French trial is the smaller trials, uh, 400 patients, charted the US trials, 800 patients, and then we'll move to the uh, British trial, which is even uh, bigger. Regarding progression-free survival, I think the data are very clear. If you're using the stacks all up front, you, it will take a longer time for your patient to suffer from progression including radiographic or clinical progression, so not only PSA progression. 
So by itself, this is something to consider when thinking about chemo. This was very clear in the, actually, in the three trials. Now, having said that, the two first trials, the French trial, GT15, and the US trial, uh, charted, reported apparently um, discordant uh, findings with regards to overall survival, with the uh, French trial uh, supporting a non-superiority for the stack cell, just a trend. Uh, the, as you can see on the screen, the medians uh, look good, 61 months versus 47 months, but the hazard ratio is not different. As opposed to charted, where really the medians are actually almost the same, but the hazard ratio is uh, greater and uh, this is significant. So why this? Uh, perhaps simply because the French trial is uh, smaller, so harder to find uh, a difference, or perhaps more patients with poor risk disease were accrued in the uh, US trial. And perhaps a final explanation is that in the French trial, we were really looking at the question of early versus deferred chemotherapy. So in av uh, other um, words, all patients in the control arm who progressed did receive salvage dostaxel as opposed to the US trial, and I believe also this is true for Stampede uh, in, the in their control arms, not all patients re received salvage chemotherapy. So, so probably with regards to this question, the French trial was the, the purest. But again, it is as it is. In Charted, there was also debate, and there is probably still debate, as to whether we should treat all patients or patients with massive dissemination to the bones or to the liver or lung. And this is because what they call the high volume disease, which is again massive dissemination, you see a, a quite meaningful uh, difference. While for patients with low volume disease, lymph node only, just one or two spots uh, for, uh, on the bone scan, the difference was not that big, though the hazard ratio uh, was uh, the same, 0.60, uh, in the two groups. And Bertrand will, will show you the updated analysis that just came out uh, last week at ESMO. So, fortunately enough, we had uh, the data from Stampede, the third trial, that reported, and this was uh, published last year, and again showing a clear um, difference in overall survival, not only in progression-free survival, and you, you see the hazard ratio and medians, but I'm sure you know that. Um, a uh, meta-analysis was performed and published also uh, this year, and it's really uh, supporting a 23% reduction in the risk of death if you're using upfront dos tag cells. So this is quite clear, and as you can see, for those of you who are not familiar with that, all trials uh, that appears to the left are favoring dos tag cell, while all those who would be to the right of a vertical bar would favor ADT alone. So it, it was clear that the four trials, because Stampede is actually two trials, are favoring, at least numerically, uh, those tag cell uh, chemotherapy. So quite big data, and this is about almost 3,000 men who were randomized, so you know, quite strong, solid data. So this is a, a proposed decision tree, uh, and this is basically what I'm doing at the moment. For patients with disseminated bone disease or visceral disease, if they're fit enough, if they're willing to get chemotherapy, I would give ADT plus a stack cell. And, this, and again, this is personal recommendation. I would use systematic GCSF because chemotherapy can kill some patients. And actually, there were some deaths in these three trials. And it seems, we're not totally sure, but it seems that GCSF can at least reduce uh, the risk of death. So I'm, I'm using it in my practice. Again, personal recommendation. Of course, some patients are unfit or not willing to get chemo, you, you would give ADT alone. Now, there are two situations where really, I think the jury is out. We don't really know how to do, and we'll discuss that further with Bertrand. One is that of a patient moving from localized disease, and then after some years developing metastatic relapse, the natural history is different, better prognosis as compared to de novo metastatic disease. How to best treat these patients, I don't really know. And remember, they were not very frequent in these three trials I just reported to you. So we don't have a lot of data. Same for patients with nodal disease only. Let's say patients with retroperitoneum lymph nodes, but no bony metastasis. 
Should we give chemo or not to these patients? I don't really know, to be honest. We need more data, and I'm trying to push my US and British colleagues to pull together the data so that we have uh, a better analysis on that. Having said that, not all patients will get chemotherapy simply because they're too frail, too old, or just they don't like chemo. So we need uh, new data for them. The good news is that very soon, we'll get new data for these gentlemen. For example, the latitude phase three trial is looking at the role of abiraterone on top of ADT for patients with what I would call terrible metastatic disease. So they have to have visceral metastasis, at least three bony metastasis, high glycine score, at least two of these three criteria. This trial has completed sacral. It will be reported before next summer. So we'll know very soon. Same and Perhaps, and very likely, the data will come together. We'll have a stampede arm testing a Beratron, very impressive academic effort to address the question in a broader situation. So in less than a year from now, we'll know whether a Beratron makes it. Now, the next question will be, if ever a Beratron improves overall survival in this setting, should we add a Beratron on top of the stack cell, yes or no? And we'll have a third trial that is currently occurring patient that is addressing this exact uh, uh, question on top also of, of the uh, question of local radiation therapy. If you like enzalutamide, there will be enzalutamide trial. And this is my conclusion. ADT plus the stack cell improves PFS and OS in this situation. This is level one evidence. Having said that, is that true for non-de novo metastatic disease, for lymph node-only metastasis, for patients with just one or two bone mats on a bone scan, and we don't even know if it's true mats in that case? I really don't know. Final um, uh, sentence. Please remember, the median age in these trials was 63, 64. The median age for all cameras with de novo metastatic <coughs> prostate cancer is greater than 70 years. Be very careful when using this data to your current practice. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. And the last speaker, Bertrand Tombal, the role for AR targeted agents. Okay. So he did the theory. I'm going to do the practice because in the end we're going to come to the same recommendation. So these are my conflict of interest. And we're going to start immediately from here. So let's put the discussion of Karim in a real perspective. Uh, let me tell you, uh, what, what would you do with that guy? He's a 71 years old Italian uh, living in Brussels. He's followed for a fluctuating PSA. First time he shows up, he's got a PSA 2,500. Elevated alkaline phosphatase, multiple bone metastases on an Anwar Padani-like initial setting. And my question to you is that guy with multiple bone metastases, perfect shape, would you treat that guy, ADT, ADT alone, please? I don't know if you can vote on your iPad. They can vote on their iPad? No? So by hand, raise your hand. Who would give chemotherapy to that guy? Who would not? Yeah, just one. Okay, interesting. Yeah. A few, a few, yeah. So thank you for showing me the few. So uh, I, I actually, uh, we may eventually agree with you uh, based on Charles Huggins, we treat patient with ADT. And what we must recognize from Huggins' lecture is actually what I call the rule of two-thirds, meaning that actually that population of men can be spread into three groups, the non-responder, the okay responder, and the extensive responder meaning patients who almost have complete responses, even also uh, based on MRI. So that's what happened to that patient who had a complete remission, disappearance of 99% of the metastatic deposit, a major crash on the PSA who goes to 0.1, and alkaline phosphatase. And actually, we have data on that three-third group. This is the Maha Hussain data that usually people use for intermittent androgen deprivation therapy. But she looked at that. She looked at overall survival of patients who have a different level of response to the initial seven months of the injection uh, ADT. And actually, you look 
the top line, if you look at the median survival in months of patients who have an extreme response to ADT, it is 75 months. Something you will see later on is actually what you reach in the low volume disease. So I think that to me, choosing based on low disease, low volume disease, high volume disease, is missing one important size of the coin, which is that, you know, the direct relationship between the response and the extent of the disease at entry. And some patients with very extensive disease may as well respond pretty well to ADT. And actually what we have done is a typical euro onco pendulum where for 25 years we gave no chemotherapy to anybody and now we want to give chemotherapy to everybody. And my dream trial would have been a conditional randomization trial, meaning that the Maha Hussain paper, those who have extensive response go to intermittent ADT and those who have an average or poor response go to tocitaxel consolidation. And, but we don't have that, so we have to live with that. And actually, if you look at the stampede data, and this is the control arm, uh, of uh, newly diagnosed metastatic prostate cancer patient, you see that the mean overall survival is 42 months. So once again, pointing at the mid and lower group. So once again, there are indications to believe that maybe patients with extreme response do uh, well only with ADT. But anyway, uh, we have to we have to be careful. Dr. Motte is in the rule, so base is in the room. So based on the evidence, I fully support the EAU guidelines that, in absence of evidence of what I say about ADT, that patient should receive docetaxel. Uh, as for the new androgen deprivation and the new AR pathways inhibitor, it is exciting. Yet we have to wait before we've got any proof there is any use of revisiting maximal androgen blockade. The second group of patients I want to speak is about that guy. He's 63 years old. He has moderate bloods. He has a PSA 15. It's a Gleason 4 plus 3 and 4 plus 4. Almost all biopsy are positive. On the technetium bone scan, it is inconclusive, as usual. I like to speak about the Department of Unclear Medicine. So what we do is actually we do a bone marrow MRI, and that guy now has one bone spot. So we do a biopsy, I can tell you it's prostate cancer. Now we have a 63 years old, perfectly fit guy, good shape, motivated, engineer, which is oligometastatic, okay? Who would give docetaxel to that guy? Raise your hand. Wow. Who would give hormone therapy to that guy? We would do a kind of peat host approach, meaning giving ADT, radiotherapy on the prostate, and radiotherapy on the single bone net foci. Wow, I'm impressed. I'm impressed because the level of evidence is actually lower than treating that guy with docetaxel. So that's very interesting. So um, actually, based on uh, Stampede paper, he qualified for having clearly a low-risk disease. He's got a only bone metastasis, Gleason score 8. He's good performance status and young patient. And actually, it is true. Uh, we look at the data, both from Charted and Stampede. There is a very important discussion, is what do we do with the low volume? Low volume are patients which include also what we call today the oligometastatic. And it is true that on the first analysis, there was no benefit reach with ADT plus docetaxel. And these are the updated data I received from Chris Sweeney, presented last week at ESMO 2016. And actually, in the low volume, you may see on the right panel that there is still no overall survival benefit at this point in time. So based on this, we can revisit the use of docetaxel in that patient. Uh, the problem is, is it a good reason to do something else? Uh, yes, indeed, that patient is oligometastatic. He's got a single bone met. But you have to be careful because that is oligometastatic disease, meaning at some point you do one exam to somebody. You have no idea whether it is a stable con condition or it is a guy which is simply exploding. And indeed, if it is a stable condition, then radical treatment could be advocated. If not, it needs systemic treatment. And the problem to, no, to me is not to assess the benefit of radiotherapy, is to understand the biology of the two group of patients. 
And uh, we know it is feasible. And I know that in urology, we are the best to make the difference between what is feasible and what is useless. But it's, it's not that simple. So there are many studies, and including PET studies, showing that you could eventually treat these patients locally. And there are cases, it works well, that patient, oligometastatic, the garlic plus uh, radiotherapy on the metastatic foci, and one and a half year after, is free on ADT and have complete response. Uh, but these treatments have some complication. This is a salvage lymph node dissection, and you see at the complication, uh, you may have complication. And actually, it doesn't work all the time. This is another patient treated in a similar setting, so newly diagnosed oligometastatic patient, no docetaxel, treated with ADT plus uh, radiotherapy on the bone mat. You see it's working uh, well. The, the PSA is, 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 low, is low, and but the metastatic deposit is not changing. And actually, six months after, this is the guy. So uh, a posteriori, that guy could have benefited from docetaxel. So uh, as a conclusion, uh, we all want, and I'm surprised that we, we, we all want to jump on that discordance we see between high volume and low volume. But in the end, I fully support EAU guidelines that not treating this patient with docetaxel and administrating local therapy actually should be more an exception than the rule. That the rule is that we have three randomized controlled trials who show uh, altogether there is a benefit. The low volume, okay, it's controversial. But as for any other further strategy, it really needs to be done with uh, deep thinking, clinical trial, and analyzing the detail before we jump on this uh, massively. Thank you very much.